I've been using my NVIDIA GTX 1080 for about four years now. It's been a great card for gaming, streaming, and even video rendering. Now, it's kept up with most of these tasks, but after upgrading my monitor to a 1440p monitor and trying to do gaming and streaming at the same time, it's starting to struggle. And it's also starting to show its age while I'm rendering videos. So when the RTX 30 series was announced, I knew it was time to leapfrog over the 20 series and go straight for an RTX 3090 to do some machine learning. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're going to talk about using an RTX 30 series for machine learning. And real quick, before we get started, if you have a question about anything we talk about today, check out my live stream on Twitch. I spend a lot of time there hanging out with you. So if you have a question about anything we talk about today, stop in and say hello. And another thing, real quick, thanks ahead of time for the likes and comments because it lets me know if I'm on track. And so, Let's get into it. So I ended up picking up an RTX 3090 series. This card is a beast. It's all metal, it weighs almost 5 pounds, and looks incredible. I personally love the all metal design that they're going for, but I do wonder if this was an afterthought after they realized how much heat this thing generates, because it gets hot. But we'll get into some of that in a little bit. But that's because it can crunch and process so much data. But anyway, it's a triple slot GPU, so it's going to take up three slots. And it has 24 gigs of RAM. <laughs> yes, 24 gigs of RAM. And I bet you're asking why I need 24 gigs of RAM? Well, I don't really. But some of the workloads I do are taking lots of RAM. And so most of my gaming and encoding workloads aren't going to use that much RAM. But some other workloads, like machine learning, can take advantage of all of that RAM. And so my workloads have actually changed since my last video card. This time when choosing a card, I wanted to choose a card that would help me render videos faster, give me better streaming performance, and that includes gaming plus streaming on the same machine, and of course, better performance when I do play games, and possibly machine learning. Now, I'd like to know a little bit more than I do now about machine learning, and I thought picking up a 39 could help with this task. Oh yeah, and I think the limited supply of 3080s helped sway my choice too, because I'd probably still be trying to hunt down a 3080 over the next six months. And so I've noticed that the 3090s, when they do come in stock, are in stock for about 30 seconds whereas the 3080s are about three, and that's if you're lucky. So anyways, when a 3090 became available, I jumped on the opportunity. And so I decided to dabble a little bit in machine learning to learn a little bit more about neural networks. And I also wanted to try object detection on my camera, so I decided to see what was out there. And that's when I discovered Darknet. So Darknet is not to be confused with the dark web, it has nothing to do with it. But Darknet is an open source neural network framework. It's written in C and also in CUDA, which is NVIDIA's parallel computing platform, and CUDA allows you to dramatically speed up computing tasks by offloading them to your GPU. And if you're subscribed and seen some of my videos, this is very similar to what we do when we Plex transcode. We offload the transcoding to the GPU. And so if we're able to offload that task to the GPU and use some lower level languages and libraries and things that are highly optimized for that GPU, we can do it faster and more efficient. But anyways, enough about the hardware and the software behind the hardware. Let's talk about the software we're going to use today because this is where it gets interesting. So Darknet, it's open source and it's on GitHub and written in C and CUDA. And so my first thought was, okay, I have to compile this. Let's try running on Windows and Docker. That led me down a rabbit hole of upgrading WSL1 to WSL2, installing Docker that had support for WSL2. Then I installed a beta NVIDIA driver, which allowed me to expose my GPU to the Docker container that was exposed to WSL2, only to find out that this whole entire stack I just installed only runs if I join the Insider program from Windows 10 which means I had to be on the dev release channel, which is extremely unstable. So I did what anyone would do in this situation and installed everything and I went for it. And I tried to make this work, but boy, did it fail. And it's not like the whole thing failed. The stack that I built actually worked quite well. So on Windows, on Docker, on WSL2, I can actually communicate with the video card, which is pretty interesting because that WSL2 is running inside of a Windows virtual machine. So if you think about it, I was actually able to pass through my GPU 
to a Linux virtual machine running on Windows that's running Docker. It sounds complicated, and it was, but then it didn't actually work the way I wanted it to. I needed access to the GUI and not just WSL. And so I decided then I'll just compile it on my machine, bare metal. And that involves installing a ton of libraries, tools, IDEs, you name it, I had to install it. And so this took a ton of time. So after losing days, not hours, I finally was able to compile this. And the icing on the cake was that it took over three hours to compile. And then to top all that off, when it did compile, it didn't have CUDA support. So that's when I decided to switch over to Linux. So I ended up dual booting my workstation like the good old days. I used to run a dual boot all the time, but now I spend most of my time in a Linux terminal. But it was actually quite refreshing to run Ubuntu on my workstation again, and pretty enjoyable and pretty easy. Now you might be asking, well, why didn't you just spin up a Linux virtual machine on your Windows machine? Well, that's because I need access to the GPU. And so I can't pass the GPU through that I'm using from my Windows machine to my Linux machine. And plus, I wanted totally separation of concerns and raw performance for the tasks that I'm going to do. So anyways, that, that, that's a whole lot about just getting my machine ready. And after installing all of the dev tools and updates and all the dependencies I needed, I was finally able to compile Darknet. Now, it's no easy task. Just because it's Linux didn't make it any easier. Uh, it just made it work, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. Maybe in a future video, I'll show you how to compile Darknet, but that's not what this is about. This is more about the results I got from Darknet. So I wanted to do some object detection, and I wanted to start out with a photo. We'll move on to video here in a little bit, but I wanted to start out with a photo just to make sure it's doing what it should be doing. So again, just a quick review on Darknet. It's not the dark web, it's Darknet, and it's an open source neural network. And it helps you do things like object detection, image classification, even a nightmare mode that's kind of creepy that I think Google demoed a while ago. And it supports NVIDIA video cards, but you can run this on a CPU too. This might take a little bit longer. And also they have pre-trained models. Now I could train my own models if I'd like to, but that takes a lot of time and a decent amount of effort and they've done it already for me. And so the first thing I wanted to do with Darknet was actually do object detection against a static image. And so if you see here in this command, I'm actually gonna run Darknet with the detector and then I'm gonna pass it a YOLO v3 config and a YOLO v3 weight. And so YOLO actually stands for you only look once and it's a new approach to object detection and it's very performant and very, very fast. And so in here, I'm passing a YOLO v3 config and a YOLO v3 weights. And then I'm gonna pass it my image. And we can do a deeper dive on Darknet or YOLO sometime, but I'm gonna show you the output. And so after passing it the image, it's actually gonna process this on my video card and then create a predictions image of things it detected. And so here's the photo that I'm passing in right here. It's a picture of me and my friends at my wedding. And here's the picture afterwards. So here's everything it detected in this photo. So you can see it did some person detection here. So my friend Tian, he got almost 100% person detection. Me, I'm about a 97%. My friend Ryan, about 100%. And my friend Jesus, about a 77%. But that's pretty awesome. This ran in like five seconds. And you can see it's trying to detect something here in my friend Ryan's back, a handbag. It's obviously not. Uh, but you can see it detect an umbrella here and a tie here too. And so this model that it's using is pre-trained and it has a lot of objects already in its database. And it's able to do this really fast and I have it running on my GPU. Now on image detection, you don't need that much horsepower. You do one image at a time, it detects it, makes some predictions and outputs the file. So doing this on a CPU is totally fine. But what happens if you want something real time? Say like a video feed. And that's when I decided to point it at one of my camera feeds. So I just recently upgraded my camera system and they have RTSP endpoints. And with those endpoints, I can point Darknet at it and do object detection in real time. So let's give it a shot. And here we go. So this is a camera I have right here in the room and it's doing real time object detection. You can see it detected the sofa back there, the vase, and even a potted plant. And then of course me, it's a small delay, uh, but this is actually really awesome. So let's make this full screen really quick. So this is doing it in real time and it can detect things. 
like I can pick up this bottle. And obviously it's, it's getting a little confused, <laughs> but you know, it should be able to detect this bottle. It's, it's in this person box right now. So there we go. Bottle, cell phone, cup. So this is really awesome. And this is in real time right now. Does it understand what a pencil is? Not really. It's about glasses. My other pair of glasses I never wear. My backup pair, marker. I think it's getting a little confused because, you know, I'm, I'm actually a person holding this and I'm in the person box. But things like, what about a remote control? Oh, <laughs> so that's interesting. It thinks that this is a cell phone. I, I can see why. I mean, it's a person holding it and then it's shaped like a cell phone and it kind of has buttons too. So I can totally get that cell phone. It's a pretty high prediction rate though. Anything from 70 to 90% it thinks it's a cell phone. But what happens? Do the backside, no button. Still thinks it's a cell phone. I think that has to do with the shape and that a person is holding it. And so you can have like a ton of fun with this, right? You can you can do a lot of things. You can you can let this run, grab a bunch of objects, walk in the room, have it detect them and see what it says. But there are better ways to apply this. I mean, you could use something like this with your home security system. And there are some options out there for this that do something very similar that we'll talk about in a little bit. So after I got that working, I decided to run it against a lot of my old videos. I was curious to see what it would detect in those videos. And the results were really awesome. But this did take quite a bit of processing power. So in real-time capture mode, it only needs to process 25 frames per second because that's how many frames per second this camera outputs. But on a video that's previously recorded, it can go as fast as the GPU can process. And that's when I realized how much power this thing draws. So when I pointed it to a video and did real-time detection on it, it actually pegged the GPU and drew almost 350 watts of power. Now that's a ton of power from a GPU and I won't use that all the time. And honestly, I probably wouldn't even have noticed unless my UPS alarm wasn't going off because I was overdrawing what it was putting out. But anyways, I won't be doing a lot of object detection full time on, on videos. But when I did run it, I got some really awesome results. So that was pretty awesome. At least it was for me, seeing all the object detection going on. It's interesting some of the things it detected too. But as you can see, it's not perfect, but it's close. It does a great job on people, and I think that's good enough. So after running it on some of my old home videos, I decided to go a little crazy and run it against some of my gameplay videos. And I had some super interesting results. But You'll see that in a future episode, so make sure you're subscribed. So what's next? Well, I've been thinking about how I can integrate this into my own video streams for my home security. The good news is, is that it doesn't take a ton of processing power to do something like this. You can do this with almost any NVIDIA card that's out there, similar to maybe how you've been using your NVIDIA video card to transcode Plex streams. I realized that a little bit of CUDA goes a long way. Sounds kind of weird, but it does. And if you don't have a card that supports CUDA, you can always do this on your CPU. And object detection like this has even been bundled up in nice little packages. There's one called Dudes. <laughs> Sweet name. There's one called Dudes that runs on Home Assistant, where it can do object detection against your home security cameras, which then you don't have to rely on cloud-based object detection. And there's even a standalone server called DeepStack. Now, DeepStack is an open source AI server that you can run in your own infrastructure. It can do face recognition, object detection, face matching, and a bunch of other algorithms on-prem in your own infrastructure. And the features for it are growing every day. It's open source, you can check it out if you like. I'll have a link in the description below if you're interested. But the good news is, is that none of this requires a high-end video card. Yes, I did buy a 3090, but I could have gotten by with a 3080 or 3070. And to be honest, my 1080 would probably handle most of these tasks pretty good. So whether or not you have an NVIDIA video card, I encourage you to check out object detection 
and some AI and some deep learning, all of it, because it's super, super interesting stuff. It's a lot easier to get started than you think. And so what do you think about deep learning and object detection and AI and everything we talked about today? Do you think you can apply this to anything you're doing right now? If so, let me know in the comments below. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you have a question about this video or any of my videos, hop in my stream and let's figure it out. So thanks so much for watching. And until next time, stream on my friends. I love gaming, but this was the first video card I've, I've ever bought where gaming wasn't the priority for my video card and uh, gaming's coming. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's nice to know that my video card can do more than gaming at least, um, or that I should put it this way, that software, uh, cre creators of software are taking advantage of pieces of video card that have been there for a while, like, like NVENC.